I'd like to welcome everyone to the Sherman Oaks Homeowners Association meeting in uh, January. Um, so it should be an exciting meeting with Congresswoman Karen Bass. And so I want to start off by introducing the board of directors or having them do it. Uh, Matt? Sorry about that. I'm Matt Epstein. I'm uh, co vice president of the Sherman Oaks Homeowners Association. And I will be your question person tonight. Okay, Jules. Where is Jules? You're we muted, lost Jules. Mute it. How's that? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Uh, hi, I'm Jules Fear, Vice President of the Sherman Oaks Homeowners Association and Honorary Mayor of Sherman Oaks. Who made you honorary mayor? Uh, the city council. Okay. Uh, next up is Tom. Hi, Tom Glick, uh, proudly serving the board since 2017. Okay, uh, John. Hi, I'm John Eisen. I'm the treasurer of the association. I want to thank the Congresswoman for coming tonight and for her uh, coming to our toy drive in December. Okay, um, Maria. Uh, Maria Pavel Kalban. I am the chair of the legislative committee for SOHA. Okay, is Marshall on? Apparently not. Okay, Nancy. Hi, everybody. I'm Nancy Segoyan. I am uh, the membership chair for SOHA. I'd like to welcome everyone. And um, if you're if you live in Sherman Oaks and you're not a member of SOHA, you should be. If you care about your community, it's a small investment that yields big returns. And if you'd like to know more about membership, you can email me at joinsoha at gmail.com, or you can go to our website, which is soha914.com, click on join SOHA, and we welcome you as a member. It's a small yearly investment that yields a really big return in protecting quality of life because SOHA is the only nonprofit member supported community organization here in Sherman Oaks. And we are dedicated to improving our quality of life. So thanks for joining Thank us. Uh, Dre. Hi, I'm Jay Weitzler. I am the on the board and the secretary for the organization. And I wanted to thank the congressman as congresswoman as well for appearing tonight. And I can see by the number of attendees, I'm not the only one that is looking forward to what she has to say. Okay. Okay. Um, next uh, is Heidi available to speak. Bob. I, yes, I, she is. Yes. So uh, Heidi is uh, running for city attorney. Uh, could you introduce yourself to everyone? And, and have three minutes and tell us about yourself in three minutes. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm gonna take two seconds to second what Nancy said. You don't even need to live in Sherman Oaks to join the organization. I've been a member for two or three years um, just because of the utility of the information and the great work that you all do. Um, I am running for Los Angeles City Attorney. Uh, it's one of three elected positions citywide, and it is not to be confused with the district attorney. They are two very different jobs. Uh, I usually like to start out with what does a city attorney do? And besides being an elected official, the city attorney is actually the managing general partner or its equivalent of one of the largest public law firms in the country. Uh, the city attorney's office has 550 lawyers and another 500 and some odd employees. And so the ability to manage lawyers and multidisciplinary teams and get organized and do the administrative and execution work of the office is really part of a big part of the day-to-day -day job. Um, the second piece of the job is being general counsel to the city. That doesn't mean being general counsel to an elected official. That means the city as a whole, you have to draft every ordinance, every resolution, every legislation. You provide advice to every proprietary department and every agency within the city. Um, you bring civil litigation, you defend civil litigation, and you administer the criminal justice system to the extent of misdemeanors within city limits. 
that's it. It's a limited criminal uh, office. And the last um, piece of the job uh, really is this concept that as a citywide official, you owe an obligation to act in the best long-term interest of the city. So what can the city attorney actually do? Well, Heidi Feldstein Soto, that's me, has taken a look at that. And there's a lot that the city attorney's office can do that would be helpful. When I was in private practice and I was born and raised in San Juan, Puerto Rico, I came to the mainland United States to go to college and law school. And I was a partner at two big international firms. And as I used to say to my clients, the job of a lawyer is to figure out how to get things done. If it's not illegal, immoral, or fattening, my job as a lawyer is to figure out how to make something work. And if you take a look at our city, we are spending two to $3,000 per square foot to build housing for our unhoused population right now. I've been saying since last February that part of the problem is no bid sole source contracts. Our city charter requires competitive bidding. And the LADWP bribery guilty pleas just proved me right. And so from my vantage point, the city attorney's office has the power to approve as to form legality and do authorization every contract over $5,000. Uh, I like to say to people, ask me how many no bid contracts uh, I'm going to approve when the per square foot price of the housing is two to $3,000 per square foot. And the answer is none. Now that doesn't actually build housing, but what it does do is it opens up the gates so that other people can bid. And if all you did was bring the cost down from two to $3,000 per square foot to two to $300 a square foot, which is what it should be, our triple H money, instead of building 7,000 units would build 70,000 units. There's a lot more to the equation. I'm not gonna take up time. This is not my meeting, but I wanted to introduce myself. I thank Richard and the board very much for the opportunity. I'm gonna put my websites in the chat and my cell phone. And please feel free to call. Please feel free to email me. Whatever questions you have, I will be happy to answer. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Next up is um, our neighborhood prosecutor, attorney uh, Andy um, Solomon. Um, and you have two minutes. Bob, you're, you're keeping time, right? I sure am. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Hi, everyone. My name is Andy Solomon. I'm from the city attorney's office. I'm your neighborhood prosecutor for Van Nuys Division in Sherman Oaks. I handle a lot of the cases that are uh, situations, not only cases, that are uh, chronic or need a little bit more special attention that a typical prosecution process would not solve. Uh, right now, one of the things that I'm paying close attention to is Ventura and Stern. Our two senior lead officers that are here have been working on it. Um, but I've, I've seen a lot of emails. I've been on the chain, uh, email chain for, and uh, just been closely watching that. But uh, the senior lead officers, I'll, I'll let them give updates on that if they'd like, but they're handling a lot of it. We've had a lot of homeless uh, in that area, and it's been a, quite a spike and some concerns from the, the neighborhood. That is an example of the things that I need your partnership in to solve. Uh, you guys live in the neighborhood, you work in the area, you know uh, what's unusual and what's going on. So uh, I urge you to email me or the senior lead officers, I work very closely with them, or uh, council district four, you have Alex uh, Nassif on, on this call as well. We all work together to solve these problems. I will leave my email in the chat, but I'll also say it here. It's Andy, A-N-D-Y dot Solomon. I think it's right here, S-O-L-I-M-A-N, at lacity.org. Feel free to email me or uh, tell the senior lead officers if you wanna meet with me and you, you don't remember my email address, they, they'll connect you to me. And even if I don't know, even if I'm not, even if the solution is not in my purview, I will help you find the person who will solve the problem for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next up is Ryan. Um, Brian, if you could unmute yourself. Thank you, Richard. Hi, everyone. 
Hi, Maria, Nancy, Bob, good to see you. Ryan Hari. I'm the Sherman Oaks Field Representative for Assemblymember Adrin Nazarian in the 46th Assembly District. Uh, first, um, now that redistricting is over, um, I wanted to let you all know that we will continue to represent Sherman Oaks uh, in the 46th Assembly District until December 2022. Uh, the uh, legislature's uh, map changes don't take effect until December of this year. So we will continue to represent Sherman Oaks um, until then. Um, I want to let you all know that the legislature is back in session. The assembly member uh, is back in Sacramento uh, working away. Um, this is anticipated to be a regular session. Last year, Speaker Rendon allowed legislators to introduce about 13, 15 bills in uh, efforts to reduce COVID transmissions in the Capitol. This year, it's actually looking to be the normal amount, which is about 25 to 30 bills per assembly member. So until something changes, I will let you all know, but we're anticipating a regular schedule um, in terms of introducing bills. The governor announced uh, a historic budget, $286 billion, $47 uh, billion will be anticipated to be surplus, um, and the assembly member will make sure that uh, the San Fernando Valley um, gets its fair share as a member of the budget committee, making sure that a lot of our priorities are did. Um, I also wanted to let you all know that uh, the California Finance Housing Association Agency uh, launched its mortgage relief program. So as many as 40,000 mortgage uh, uh, holders in California can receive assistance with their mortgage relief if they are about behind on payment. Uh, okay, uh, as well, much as we have, we're having trouble uh, hearing you. Um, so, okay, um, thank you very much. Uh, next up, uh, Senior Lead. Thank officers. you, Richard. Okay, Senior Lead, uh, Jose, why don't you lead her off? Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you. Uh, Happy New Year, everybody. Um, um, I'm the Senior Lead Officer for, for the Southern portion of Sherman Oaks. I cover everything pretty much south of Ventura towards uh, Mulholland. Uh, between Coldwater Canyon and Sepulveda. Uh, yes, I work real closely with uh, Annie Solomon, uh, uh, Alex uh, uh, Nassib from CD4. Uh, and uh, yes, we do have a few issues. Uh, first of all, the Ventura and Stern issue, we've, uh, uh, there's been a couple, if you guys know, it's right next to 7-Eleven, uh, right, uh, they had a couple of encampments and a, a lot of debris and trash and uh, there was a lot of issues concerning uh, these homeless. Uh, we pro were working with LASA and CD4 and, uh, uh, and some partners. We were able to uh, get that place cleaned up and get some, try to get some help from these uh, individuals to, to move on. Uh, we still we're, we're maintaining that uh, constant um, patrol at that location till the encampments don't go up there. But uh, for the most part, we just started in a fresh year. Our numbers are, are fresh, uh, pretty much zero, zeroed out from last year. But uh, uh, we're pretty cons constant to um, very low crime or no uh, in, in Sherman Oaks area. Okay, um, and maybe um, uh, uh, Officer Romo can comment. It seems like there's been a lot of uh, bad incidents in Sherman Oaks recently, um, uh, all over the news. Uh, what, what's happening in Sherman Oaks and why are we in the news all the time? Yes, good evening, everyone. I'm Officer Romo. I cover the northern part of Sherman Oaks um, from the 405 to Coldwater, Chandler South, and the 101 North. Um, yes, we do have um, some spike in the northern part of Sherman Oaks. I can tell you that Year to date, we've had two robberies. One was at the 7-Eleven uh, or Moore Park in Fulton, and the other one was at the mall, at the Westfield Mall. Um, a lot of the shoplifting and thefts are up as well at the mall, but I can tell you that Operations Valley Bureau, can you mute your Operations Valley Bureau um, conducted a Zoom meeting with all the retailers um, all over the valley. So they brought in city attorneys um, and, they explain the do's and the don'ts um, when it comes to uh, thefts at retailers, um, at, at retailer places. But I also wanted to, as we, some of us are aware, we did have a homicide 
Um, the suspect lived in Sherman Oaks. Um, he had family in Fresno. He went up to Fresno. He killed his mother and, and grandpa with a chair and scissors. He came back to Sherman Oaks um, because of the um, productivity with the community. They were able to give tips to Fresno homicide detectives and to us, Van Nuys Division. And the suspect was apprehended in the area of Sepulveda and Van Nuys. Um, because we're so low on police officers nowadays, um, I am still urging the community to um, be volunteers for us, for LAPD. Last night, my partner and I, Officer Saldana, went out with our volunteer coordinator and about um, 11 volunteers. They were out there as um, UC volunteers, undercover volunteers in different types of cars. We were on Ventura Boulevard, um, small streets, um, you name it, we were running cars, just high visibility for the black and whites, and the volunteers were out there giving us information on what they were observing. I, I encourage everyone, if you would like to be a volunteer for LAPD, to please contact me. My email address is 40229 at lapd.online, 40229 at lapd.online, and let's be part and, um, and work with each other as volunteers, and you can work with us as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, next up <clears throat> is Jessica Lal, who is a candidate for mayor. Jessica. Thanks, Richard. It's great to be here with you all. I think I met some of you at the Winter Toy Drive. I'm Jessica Lal. I'm running to be LA's next <clears throat> mayor. Just a couple of notes on my professional background. I currently serve as president and CEO of the Central City Association. We represent over 300 large and small businesses across the city and do advocacy work on issues pertaining to homelessness, housing, economic development, public safety. Before that, I ran a business improvement district in the city where we did things like fix 800 sidewalks in two weeks, uh, supported, again, the small businesses, ran in clean and safe programs. And before that, I worked for Mayor Viragosa on the business team coming out of the recession. So I was the point person for, again, many small businesses uh, trying to do and get around city bureaucracy. So I bring over 10 years experience working and leading and managing uh, from the front lines on our city's most pressing issues. I'm running for to be the next mayor because I believe the status quo, frankly, has failed our city. And it is time to bring in leadership with fresh ideas and approaches to enact meaningful change. We're facing so many crises and compounding issues. Uh, today, our campaign rolled out a very specific plan for how we're going to actually implement change and create more accountability with respect to homelessness. Um, I don't have time to get into the full plan, but part of it calls for the creation of a Department of Homelessness, where we will put representatives from all departments across the city that touch homelessness to work together in the same office working side by side. When it comes to the city and county relationship, I would use one of the mayoral appointments to appoint myself and other council members to immediately serve on LASA to create more accountability and transparency. Um, I will post our website um, into the chat. Would love to chat more. There are so many other issues that we must address from public safety to economic development to just sort of the rampant corruption that we've seen at City Hall. And I'll end with saying how personal this is for me. I am the proud mom of a two-year-old who I want to raise here in this city. I want her to walk down our streets, go to schools. Our home on the uh, west side of town has unfortunately been broken into and burglarized twice in four years. I feel firsthand the stress and anxiety. We must do better. Uh, we are the creative capital of the world, and there's no reason that we can't tap into the intelligence and creativity that exists in our backyard to solve problems. So I know I'm just a guest here tonight to introduce myself. I'm happy to come back, meet with you separately. Again, please feel free to reach out, uh, jessicalawformayor.com. I'll also drop my email into the chat. would love to hear from you, and thanks again for having me. Appreciate how well organized this meeting was. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Richard, next up is uh, Alex. Richard, could you, yeah, Alex, thanks. Alex, can you introduce yourself and- uh... Hi everyone, hi Richard, hi Jules. 
Hi, everyone. Good to see you. Thank you, Bob. My name is Alex Nassif. I'm your field deputy for the Office of Council Member Rahman. Um, some quick updates. Our homelessness count was postponed um, to February 22nd. So you still have time to gather your partner and complete your training. Um, and uh, just an FYI, proof of vaccination will be required on the day of this count. Um, we have had um, a lot of uh, people reaching out to our office about bringing pickleball to the Van Nuys Sherman Oaks Park. So if uh, you all are interested, please let me know, but look forward to um, the beginning of our community outreach process. We want to make sure that we're communicating with both tennis players and pickleball players um, to make sure that folks are aware of what's going on. Round three of the city's comeback check um, is starting soon. The deadline is January 25th. Uh, this program provides up to $5,000 in grants um, to approximately 5,000 businesses across the city through a lottery process. Um, if you have already applied, please reach out to me and I can help you uh, get an update on that application. An update from LA Sanitation, they are currently experiencing staffing shortages. Um, if you reach out to me, I can send you the link to their website where you can check to see if your route in particular was missed. There are a few COVID testing options, both from the state and our federal partners. Um, you can order a rapid test to be sent to your home, or you can go and pick up a PCR kit at a county site um, and then return them. Uh, for your results. You can also reach out to me and I can connect you with those partners. Um, and last but not least, um, I'm just asking everyone, if you see something, please say something. We did unfortunately have a fire at a commercial building along Ventura last week. Luckily, thankfully, no lives, um, no injuries were harmed and all the local businesses and homes were spared. Um, building and safety was already on top of it and senior lead officer Romo, had already been made aware, um, but it's really important for neighbors to reach out to us and let us know when they see these things, abandoned buildings, bulky items, overflowing trash bins, traffic related items. I'm your girl and I believe that was under two minutes. I will put my name and email in the chat. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have just a couple more minutes left. Uh, Maria, uh, oh. quick update. Quick update because I don't have much to say. Uh, none of the housing bills from the Senate have been released yet. We're told they're going to be sending quite a few uh, regarding single family neighborhoods, but so far nothing. Uh, the Assembly has uh, released a couple and we're tracking them. And our motion to implement guidelines for SB9 has been stalled at Nuri Martinez's office. So we're working on that to see if we can get it to a full vote at the council off at the city council. So that's my report. Thank you, Bob. Thanks, Richard. Uh, I'm Bob Anderson, and I'd like to talk to you for a second about Metro and the Sepulveda Transit Corridor Project, the rapid transit that's going to go from the valley to the west side. Right now, you may have heard Metro narrowed it down to six different alternatives. And they're holding public scoping meetings. They've had two, they have one more on the 22nd of this month where they tell the public what's going on. Unfortunately, Metro doesn't tell you a lot. Uh, on a scale of one to 10, they give you about one or two of the information that they should. And then they ask you to submit comments by February 11th. It's hard to submit a comment when they don't tell you anything. So it's a, a nice trick that Metro plays on us. Don't tell people anything and then ask them for comments. They don't get many comments. They can do what they want. We're trying to fix that. Five of the alternatives that Metro has selected to look at are not bad. They need some work. Um, they need to be fixed here and there, but they're reasonable. Three monorails and two subways. But there is one alternative that absolutely stinks. It's abominable. It's subway on the west side, subway under the hill, but they bring the trains out of the ground in Sherman Oaks so they can do a bunch of eminent domain across the street from Whole Foods and then bother everybody on Sepulveda Boulevard for five miles because folks, these are big, big trains with steel wheels and you're gonna hear them a mile away. 
And during rush hour, they're going to go by about every minute. So it's pretty bad. We started a campaign to try to get Metro to just stop looking at this concept or at least get enough comments in. We sent 7,000 flyers by mail to all the people who live on the route. We sent out email blasts. We need your help. It uh, shows the route, which is all the way up Sofobita to Oxnard and beyond. If you have any questions or you want to help us, email me at stop, S-T-O-P, Metro, M-E-T-R-O, ALT, A-L-T, that stands for alternate, for stop, Metro, alternate, for at gmail.com. And we'll be glad to tell you how to help, how to send a comment to Metro to stop them from ruining and destroying our community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Okay, uh, next up is our guest speaker this evening, Congresswoman Karen Bass, uh, a candidate for mayor. Um, and we appreciated the fact that you came to the toy drive and people enjoyed talking with you at the toy drive. So with that, I'll, I'll turn the meeting over to you. Uh, and then when you're done, uh, we'll have questions from the audience. Great. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to speak with you today. And uh, I did enjoy the toy drive. It was very nice being there and it was very nice meeting the uh, folks from the Sherman Oaks Homeowners Association. Uh, I mentioned to Richard maybe a couple of months ago, I wasn't sure if he remembered me, but I actually worked very closely alongside you many years ago in the 1990s. The la one of the last times when our city was in the midst of a crisis, a public health crisis, a public safety crisis. And I had started a community organization in South Central Los Angeles after the civil unrest, when there was a lot of destruction in the area, a lot of liquor stores were burnt down. And your homeowners association and my organization, Community Coalition, used to meet uh, in City Hall, speaking up about different land use issues. We fought hard in South LA for public participation in land use issues. And I continue to believe that that is very critical, especially in today's crisis that we face. The crisis that we face, from my point of view, is another public health and public safety crisis. It's really a humanitarian crisis this time around. And of course, I'm talking about homelessness and the fact that we have 40,000 people who are unhoused on our streets. And then in addition, we have a public safety crisis, some of it related to homelessness and some of it not. I do believe that the first job of the mayor is to make sure that the city is safe, to keep Angelino safe. We have to respond to this crisis, and now I'm referring to the crisis of the unhoused, I believe like it is a natural disaster, except for it's a man-made disaster. And what I mean by that is that this is not something that happened overnight. I certainly watched it happen over many, many years. I spent a number of years working at LA County in the emergency room. I took care of homeless patients and I had to deal with crime victims, putting them back together. I worked in the trauma unit. And so I saw the results especially of mental illness and substance abuse. And I think over the years, because that was when the crisis was starting, and I think over the years, the city in a way kind of grew to accept it. And I think while the city grew to accept it and was dealing with it as though it was a problem that would never go away, it absolutely metastasized, metastasized into what we are dealing with today. It's just unconceivable to think that we have that many people who are unhoused. And in 2020, we had over 1,500 people that died on the streets of Los Angeles who were unhoused. The other day, I released a plan around how I believe we should address the homelessness uh, issue. And I think that we need to change how we view it. And we need, again, to view it as though it is an absolute crisis. And when you have a crisis, when you have a man-made crisis or a natural disaster, you really pull out all stops. I remember the earthquake in 1994 and the epicenter in Reseda. We had a lot of problems south of the 10 freeway also because the housing stock is so old. I remember when the 10 freeway fell. And I remember how the city pulled out all stops, 
all stops and rebuilt the 10 freeway and rebuilt many parts of our city. And I think that that's the type of mentality we need to bring to this crisis. I'm proposing that we can build 15,000 new units. And the first order of business would be to look at government owned property, would be to look at unused buildings or commercial buildings that perhaps could be uh, converted. I know people are very concerned about SB9 and SB10. And frankly, if I were in the state legislature and I did serve there six years, I would have been very concerned about it as well because it opens the door for speculators to come in to, and to change the basic character of our neighborhoods. Uh, I like Paul Koretz's motion. And I, I heard from the report a few minutes ago that that motion, I believe that's the one that was referred to is stalled right now, but absolutely needs to be dealt with. I think, I wasn't there, I was in DC, but I think what might have happened in Sacramento is people being concerned all around the state about um, cities being unable to deal with this crisis. And so then the state acts. But just like I don't think the city should act without public participation and neighborhood participation, I think it's the same with the state as well. And it's important to have guardrails that are there. Um, I'm very impressed with your association and conversations that I had during the toy drive because there are some neighborhoods in my district, by the way, just to let you know, the 37th Congressional District goes from USC to UCLA. So I do uh, represent South Central LA and, and USC, and my district goes all the way over to the border of Santa Monica. And there are some neighborhoods that say, we don't want anything. I mean, after HHH was passed, they basically said, we will go to court, we will file lawsuits. What I've been impressed with is your association and your approach, which is to say that there are alternatives. There are all alternatives and alternatives that I discussed with some of your members during the toy drive, uh, looked at some of the commercial areas and some of our uh, malls that you know, are, are, are dying or not, um, not as busy as they were before, especially because of online. Um, uh, you know, online purchasing. So I think in our city, there's ways to deal with this problem. Now I'm in my last year in Congress and I do have to say that it was a big decision for me to make not to run for Congress again. I'm not leaving Congress because I'm dissatisfied here. I enjoy this work and I'm able to work on domestic issues and foreign policy issues, which are both very important to me. But I felt that our crisis was so severe that I needed to come home and I needed to come home and I needed to bring the experience that I had of working in neighborhoods on the ground, in the street, in a crisis, in the nineties, at the height of the violence. Um, I needed to bring that. I needed to bring the experience I had in Sacramento. I served for six years. In the last two years, I served as speaker. And I just have to tell you that I so, was so jealous to hear the assembly members representative to talk about the state budget being 280 six billion dollars. I was in charge during the Great Recession and our budget was 120 billion and it dropped to 83 billion dollars. So from 83 billion dollars, the state budget is 286 billion. What that meant is, is that I had to be in charge and make very tough decisions that were very painful to me personally because I had to cut health care, I had to cut education, but I had to do what is needed. I've gone on to Congress and I've served in leadership roles here in Congress and fought very hard at the beginning of the pandemic uh, with the last administration where uh, I'm not sure if you would know this, but the administration basically instructed uh, people to not return the phone calls of democratic members. So we couldn't communicate with the administration. And so during COVID, we had to come together and fight for the resources, the resources that we delivered to Los Angeles that helped avert a crisis in Los Angeles with the city budget, but to fight to make sure that we had the resources and the supports so that populations that were already disproportionately impacted would not become either further impacted. And so bringing all of those experiences back, I wanna to bring to this crisis because I do believe that what is needed is very decisive leadership. So one, when I held my press conference um, a week ago, I held it at a hospital. And I don't know if you're familiar with St. Vincent's Hospital in downtown LA. It is a perfectly uh, good structure that is currently being used for film production. 
And I believe that it should be used to house patients, especially people who are suffering from mental illness and substance abuse. Because I believe that I don't care how much housing you build, if you don't address the reasons why people fell into homelessness to begin with, and there are a multitude of reasons, it is not a monolith, but two main reasons that impact the population, either that led to their being unhoused or developed when they became unhoused, is mental illness and substance abuse. And so I was there to call on the governor, to ask the governor to ask the federal government, because <laughs> as an individual Congress member, I can't do that. The request has to come from the government, I mean, has to come from the governor, to give a waiver to Los Angeles so that we could open up that hospital, especially for patients that are mentally ill. Right now, the way the law and the regulations are structured, you can't have a facility for more than 16 people. That's a 344 bed hospital with an owner, by the way, who is willing to lease to the city or the county and has been trying to do that for the last five years. I have been shocked to learn about all of the lack of communication, um, infighting, uh, ego and turf battles between the city and the county that are basically unnecessary. I don't think it's, it's sufficient or acceptable to say, well, we can't deal with mental health. That's what the county does. The only way to solve this problem is for the city and the county to work hand in glove. I'm happy to say that I have close relationships with each of the members of the Board of Supervisors. I've worked with them for many, many years, in addition to some of the candidates that are running to uh, follow Sheila Kuehl. And so I believe that we can take uh, public owned property. I believe that we can convert existing businesses, existing commercial use, especially because, especially because uh, the pandemic that we've gone through, I believe is going to fundamentally change work. And so there is a possibility that there should be some commercial space that would be available. The bottom line is, is that we have to treat this like it is the emergency it is. Now, I'm in my last year in Congress. I'm happy to say that we have an administration that we can work with very closely. It might be hard to get legislation passed, but we can work with the administration. And I'm fortunate to know many of the people who are in the president's cabinet. And I intend to work those relationships and wanna give you a couple of examples of how I'm doing that right now. Um, the HUD secretary, Marsha Fudge, is, happens to be one of my closest friends, and I'm trying to work with HUD to get them to be flexible in how they use vouchers. So you know that the city has several thousand vouchers, but I'm sure you saw the article that said only um, 500 have been used out of several thousand, and part of that is because of regulations from HUD. And so HUD needs to be flexible, just like I believe LA needs to treat this like it is an emergency. HUD needs to be flexible and understand that this is absolutely emergent, an emergency. I also want to explore the idea of having this viewed as a federal emergency, not just a state of emergency in Los Angeles, which I agree with, and many of the candidates running believe we need to declare a state of emergency in Los Angeles but I don't believe that is sufficient. I also think we need to look at an emergency on a federal level. And so I'm talking to the former secretary from Homeland Security and also the current secretary to see how we might go about that. So the other big problem facing our city is public safety. We know that crime is up and we absolutely have to deal with that. Uh, as I mentioned, I believe the first order of business of the mayor is to keep the city safe and we need to make sure that the laws are enforced to the full extent and that people are held completely accountable. I think that this situation now with several high profile horrific crimes might reach the point where the country will actually look at mental illness because it is just unacceptable that we basically provide nothing for people who are mentally ill, essentially, except for the Twin Towers. And so I believe that we need to do much more in that area. We also have a number of jobs in the LAPD that really could be done by civilians. And we need to see if we can get more officers on the street and out of the civilian jobs. The LAPD has also experienced a lot of attrition and we need to address that. And I think in addressing the tradition, uh, the attrition 
it also might be an opportunity to address some of the cultural issues uh, within LAPD. I have worked for many years uh, on a program called Community Safety Partnership. This is something that was started in South LA. And I think that it is something that could move citywide. It is in many areas throughout the city, but it is a way of building a close relationship, a little different than a senior lead officer, but a close relationship between the community and policing so that um, people are uh, communicating and build the relationships with police officers and can get crime solved in a much quicker way. One of the things that I want to explore is establishing an office for community safety so that we could look at safety beyond just crime. But I think that if we deal with some of the social problems, some of the health problems in our community, that the police will be able to just focus on crime as they should. I think that it's unfair. I don't believe that people go into the police academy uh, wanting to address mental illness and some of the other social problems. If we can address those and bring proper resources, then maybe police officers can be free to do what they're supposed to do. So all of that, many, many more reasons is why I am running to be the next mayor of Los Angeles and look forward to building and rebuilding a relationship with your homeowners association. We learned a lot from you 30 years ago, and I'm sure that I would like to continue working with you and continue learning from your experience. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Matt, uh, do we have questions? We have lots of questions tonight. And um, just so that the audience knows as well, um, the, the, the questions, the, the questions or the Congresswoman knows, the questions are not from, from me, they're from members of the audience and, and folks that had sent in emails earlier. So um, some of the questions I'll ask in, in general terms, because there's quite a few questions uh, regard, you know, uh, on certain topics. Um, so if, I, if we don't get to your question, it's not because it's not the best question ever written. It's just because maybe we ran out of time or maybe Richard uh, uh, stopped me from, you know, asking all the questions. But all the questions that, that we received tonight will be forwarded to the Congresswoman and she will be able to get back with you on, on an individual basis if need be. So um, the first, the, the, obviously the most amount of questions that we received have to do with homelessness. That's, that's, that's front and center for everybody. It's, it's part of our lives. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a horrible thing. So the first uh, person that we're going to actually open up to, uh, let him ask the, the question directly, is uh, Pastor Sherman Manning. Pastor, you want to go ahead and ask your question, and then afterwards you will be muted. Everybody will be muted after your, you ask the question, so there will not be any opportunity to do a follow-up. So you're being unmuted, Pastor, and go ahead and ask your question. Yes, um, Congressman Bass. I pastor Yes We Can Worship Center. I'm on Skid Row every day. We house the homeless and feed the hungry. Uh, in fact, John Eisen is the chairman of our board. I was wondering from you, what do you think we can do when you become mayor to have churches yeah. working together with the civic community, with businesses, et cetera, to tackle this problem of homelessness? And I'd like your email address so that I can email you later on also. But that's my question. Bass Karen R at Gmail. Just don't forget the R. Bass um, Karen R at Gmail. Okay. You know, I mean, I, I, I think in general, we absolutely have to have the faith community front and center. Uh, I think that's critical. And I think that there's many different roles that the faith community can play. You know, in some instances, it might be able to be where some housing could be built. You know, some churches own a lot of property and they might be willing to um, allow housing to be built in there, again, with neighborhood input. But I, I just think that there's many, many roles that, that uh, the faith community could play. But I do think we have to move beyond, I mean, it is wonderful to do charitable, charitable work. It is wonderful to go out and to volunteer and to feed the unhoused and bring blankets and all of that. But I do think that what we have to do, I mean, in a, in a natural disaster, you act with urgency. And that's what I worry we don't have in the city right now. Everybody knows it's a problem, but it just seems like it is dealt with in such an incremental fashion. 
And I think with 1,500 people dying in a year, three or more people dying every day, we have got to change how we address this issue. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna summarize uh, just a handful of the other homeless questions that, that, that are out here. And, you know, a, a, again, as mayor, if you could summarize maybe three points, five points, you know, people are very compassionate in Sherman Oaks. People are very compassionate in the city right. for folks that are, that, that are homeless. Mm -hmm. But there's, they're, they're, but they're also very compassionate for their kids who cannot walk sure. to school anymore. Right. Who, you know, for for uh, folks that can't walk to their favorite restaurants, that can't walk under any underpass, mm -hmm. that constantly, you know, that it seems as if the general buzz uh, on, on these questions is, is that the the homeless folks have more rights today than we do, and so g give us the three or four or five hot topics. What would Congresswoman Karen Bass do if, if she was elected mayor on, on the homeless issue only? And, and you know, let me, let me just say be, before I do that, that I think one of the reasons why it, it seems that way is because of a number of the court decisions that have happened. And I think that the reason, I think I'm not a lawyer, but I think that some of the reason for some of those court decisions is to try to force the city to act. And so what I would do immediately to act would be to, would, on the emergency side, uh, as I mentioned, I support the idea of the mayor declaring a state of emergency, but I think that much more needs to be done. And so looking at all of the city-owned state, county, and federal property and putting up temporary housing immediately. Now, when we do temporary housing, we're gonna have to do it different than how it's been done in the past where you have you know, congregate housing. We are gonna be dealing with these viruses for a while. And I think we're gonna to have to come up with a new model of temporary housing. But we have to get people off the streets now. We have to get people off the streets because of the, the safety issues that they experience, but also that we experience. And again, we know we have a problem with public safety and it is not 100% related to homelessness, but some of it is. And, but I do believe that number one, people are running out of compassion. We have to address people falling into homelessness as well. And I think that that's one of the reasons why my constituents always complain that they voted for HHH and they don't know where the money went. Now housing is being built, but I know everybody here understands that for every 200 people we house, 215 new people fall into housing. And so you have to prevent people from falling into housing as well. I'm working on that right now. We have legislation that you all know is stalled in the Senate, but now they're talking about doing it in a piecemeal way. That other bill, that BBB bill, has a lot of money in it to prevent people from falling into homelessness and also to address homelessness. So 15,000 units, looking at unused properties, looking at vacant properties in the public space, and building housing uh, immediately. What would you do in, in 30 seconds or less with folks that don't want to be housed? Well, I think that outreach workers can work with them. At the end of the day, people have to move. What I have learned in talking to the people that do this work day in and day out is 95% of the people will move. But for those 5% that won't, especially if they're breaking the law, laws have to be enforced. I think that there are just some things you don't do outside and sleeping is one of them. Okay, let's, let's move on to uh, another hot topic, which is, um, uh, again, quite a few people uh, sent, sent uh, questions in about um, our, our, our current district attorney. Um, I'm gonna read one though from uh, Bill Brack Bracken, who was on, but it's not on right now. Uh, recently, the Los Angeles County Sheriff bypassed the LA District Attorney and went uh, to federal prosecutors in pressing charges against the alleged killers of off-duty police officer. There are now two call efforts, two recall efforts against the DA due to his reform politics um, that many have said are leading to an increase in crime in LA. Do you support or disagree with the current DA and his politics? There's some things I agree with and some things that I disagree with. Oh, I do have a problem in general with what is happening with recalls, though. So uh, let me just state that 
uh, for the record. And I do think that some of the reforms need to be examined and reviewed. But you know, I also have talked to people who have talked about how crime has been increasing over the last couple of years, and he's been there for a year. So I think it's really important to examine the reforms, to evaluate the reforms, to see which ones are problematic, which ones might need to be adjusted, and which ones are working uh, okay. Okay. Um, so um, Benjamin, and I'm, I'm gonna screw up his last name. Uh, he's a writer for the Los Angeles Times. His last name is O-R-E-S-K-E-S. -E he, he asked, he sent a question, and you recently, you recently ex expressed discomfort with 41.18. Yeah. That allows Los Angeles City Council to create the no encampment zones around public schools, parks, and libraries. Yeah. Work as mayor to rewrite that law or repeal it. And if you, would re if you were to rewrite it, how would you change it? No, you know, I don't, I wouldn't repeal it, but the problem I have uh, with the law is that, again, I feel like it's a piecemeal approach. I think we need a regional strategy. I mean, we need a regional strategy for the city, but we also need a regional strategy for the county. So one of the things that has happened with homelessness, and, and I, I think I would imagine that you would agree, it's kind of like a whack-a-mole. You know, I mean, okay, sure, you remove the encampment from there, and then what happens? A few days later, it go, comes back or it goes someplace else. That's kind of what I meant when I said, you know, that I think we need to have a different mindset in how we deal with this problem. If we viewed it as an emergency, I don't think we would say individual council members pick this or pick that. We would come together immediately as a city and say we have to address this problem in full. That was my concern about it. So, so going back to his question, though, mm -hmm. the, the public schools, the parks, and the libraries, in, if when you're mayor, those will be off those going to be off limits for uh, for, for homeless encampments, correct? Absolutely. That was not my concern with the. Okay. 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 So terrific. Not, not at all. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, the next question, Bob, you should be unmuted. The next question is you. You want to ask your question? Thanks, Matt. Uh, Congresswoman, you heard what I had to say a little earlier about Metro, because I, I know you were on the line. I'm yes. the Transportation Committee Chair. And if you're elected mayor, you will automatically become a Metro board member. Right. And possibly even chair, like Mayor Garcetti was for a while. Um, we need help. Yes. And uh, there are some things being done by Metro that just aren't right lack of public communication, lack of listening to the public. Uh, a lot of times when I've talked to the mayor's office and I did it yesterday to the transportation deputy, well, Metro policy doesn't allow them to do that. And I, I think you know where we're coming from. We just asked Metro to sit down and talk to us and let them explain and they wouldn't. Let, let us sit down and talk with them. We keep asking, what would you do? Could you do anything? to help that kind of a situation? Well, number one, I would make them sit down and talk with you, <laughs> first of all. Thank you. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, but again, you know, I, I believe in public participation and I think the example you gave was, they gave you no information, but then wanted you to have comment. That was it. That, yes, that, you, that's, just not it. that's just not acceptable. You know, what, one thing that, that is uh, very frustrating to me um, is bureaucracy used as excuses. And I just don't think that it is acceptable to say, well, you know, this is what the rules say. Well, who wrote the rules and why do the rules make sense? And, and if they don't, maybe they need to be put aside. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um... I just lost my place. Um, okay, so we have um, a, a bunch of questions. Actually, let me ask you. So the San Fernando Valley is about 2 million people. If the San Fernando Valley was its own city, it'd be, I think, the sixth largest city in the country. Okay, so this city of, 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 of the San Fernando Valley gets a, 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 a lot, or this, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, uh, which is obviously part of the city of Los Angeles, 
but we get very, very little respect when it comes to the, the greater city of Los Angeles with the amount of city council person, people that represent completely uh, San Fernando Valley. You know, it's always split up and, and such. Um, but we, what we also have the blessing of in, in the San Fernando Valley is two airports, two airports, uh, Burbank Airport and Van Nuys Airport. And we have zero control, zero control over input when it comes to either of those airports. Um, the amount of questions that we had tonight, um, probably, and you'll see them when we send them all to you. Um, I mean, Van Nuys Airport gets thousands of thousands of um, comments a day about low flying airport craft uh, 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 folks taking off late, late in the early mornings or late, late at night. Uh, the private jets that are, you know, uh, moving the celebrities around and they do nothing. They do absolutely nothing because they can, because the, really nobody has, has, has stopped them. As mayor of Los Angeles, what are you going to do to help the residents, not just of Sherman Oaks, but the residents of Los Angeles that are getting zero revenues from Burbank Airport, but take tons of our, our folks over, you know, as far as taking our money um, and continue to only fly over the San Fernando Valley when they don't fly over Burbank, Pasadena, or Glendale, which all three of those municipalities make money every single year after year after year. Uh, and they don't get any of the harm of the noise and the pollutants that happen. So what would you do as, 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 as mayor to help your constituents in the San Fernando Valley, especially Sherman Oaks with the noise too? Well, I'm actually thinking about, um, you know, not just as mayor, but maybe uh, now as a member of Congress. And, and by the way, your congressman who claims the city was named after him, <laughs> Brad Sherman. <laughs> Uh, but you know what, I, I'm surprised because I thought that Van Nuys and Burbank had restricted hours. You're saying they don't? They've been violating those? Uh, yeah, they've been violating those. Yes, they've been violating those forever. I've only been a resident of, of, of Sherman Oaks for 63 years. <laughs> yeah, they, they, yeah they, 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 they have sometimes have uh, a fall of them, but they always come up with reasons. Well, uh, actually, I'll talk to Brad about it uh, because the airport, you know, we have in Congress, we have a, a caucus called the Quiet Skies uh, Caucus. Uh, my uh, district, Culver City is part, is part of my district and airplane noise is one of the number one issues that we deal with. And it's very frustrating because the FAA, the only relationship Congress has to the FAA is, is its budget. And so it's very difficult uh, to control. So um, to me, I would first look at what I might be able to do now. And so I will follow up. But as mayor, you know, I would definitely uh, push the, the federal government around what is happening there, one with noise, but also with the restricted hours, because I sure thought that there were times when they couldn't fly. You know, when they did the next gen change that was supposed to make things better, I don't know what it was in the Valley, but it was horrible in LA where they concentrated the flight paths. You know what I'm talking about? When I'm oh, yeah. Yep, yep, yeah. Yeah. So that, that is a, a major problem uh, in our city that we definitely need to keep pushing the FAA on. And in terms of what you described about the Valley, you know, I did live in the Valley for a while. I lived in uh, San Fernando um, for a few years. But, you know, uh, my original bond with your organization was over um, the Valley feeling marginalized and South LA feeling marginalized. The South LA feeling as though, you know, people basically the way we were treated by city hall during the years when we used to meet each other in the city council chambers, objecting to various land use policies. Uh, we were treated like, you know, in South LA, you should be glad anybody wants to do any kind of business there. So how yeah. dare you even question it? So I feel a lot of uh, um, empathy and uh, commonality with the marginalization of the valley. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna go back to um, Susan Collins. Um, her microphone should be unmuted right now. Um, and uh, Susan's gonna go back to a, the, a question about the DA's office. Cause again, we had a lot of, of, of folks asking about that. But Susan, can you summarize your question? Because it's, it's way too long. And if you, <laughs> and if, if you can't, I will. Um, I will certainly try. Thank you. 
Um, thank you. And, and thank you, Congresswoman Bass, for coming tonight. I really appreciate your time. Um, you know, right now, as you are well aware, we've just lost two um, very uh, valued members of our community to violently, uh, mentally ill, transient people. I know uh, uh, not, this is not a problem that's unique to Los Angeles. Uh, um, the DA, we're also experiencing an uptick in robberies, um, uh, uh, um, robberies, uh, uh, follow home, shoplifting, um, et cetera. We're experiencing a lot. Oh, and um, all of this is, oh, I'm sorry, I've had it written out. Um, we're also experiencing a huge surge in burglaries, shootings, robberies, and shoplifting. All of this is at a time when we also have released thousands of inmates, reduced sentencing guidelines, and removed cash bail. Many people, including several municipalities in Los Angeles, hold uh, George Gascon responsible. Um, and on his website, uh, it displays your name and photo as a supporter of him and his policies. Can you oh. clarify it? Yeah, it's on um, standwithgascon.org. Um, do you support Gascon and the policies that have so many Angelinos living in fear and anxiety? And what would you do as mayor of Los Angeles that you are not able to do on a federal level to restore the safety and well-being of all of our community members. Uh, well, um, I'm fascinated to look at that website. I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, <laughs> absolutely no idea. Uh, there are some reforms I support and some that I don't. Now, when you mentioned ending of cash bail, it's my understanding, and, and if you understand it differently, please um, uh, let me know. My understanding is, is that that was a, a policy that was passed on the state level, but there was a ballot initiative that overturned it. My understanding of the situation of bail right now is related to COVID and um, that people were not being held. That, well, first of all, anybody that commits a violent crime was not supposed to just be released, but that that whole policy needs to be reviewed as to whether or not it is still needed. So that's my understanding of cash bail. In terms of some of the other policies that he has talked about, I believe that there are reforms that need to take place in our criminal justice system. But one of the big problems that I have had with some of the reforms, especially uh, releasing people from prison, and I went up to Sacramento, I tried to do everything uh, before this policy went into effect and then afterwards, uh, but failed is if you are going to release people from prison, number one, you should release people appropriately, not people who have long histories of violence or anything like that, but what's gonna happen to them when you release them? It is one of the problems that we are having with homelessness because there is a category of the unhoused who were formerly incarcerated, who were released with nowhere to go. I talked to Chief Moore about this and that was something that I felt was unnecessary. And I'm actually doing legislation now. I worked on legislation in Sacramento and I worked on legislation and I'm working on legislation right now to create programs to integrate people when you release people from prison. There are people that need to be released and there are people that should not be released. I also believe that we have got to deal with mental health. We have nothing right now. And I think that it is really a shame that we allow people to be completely psych psychotic on our streets. They might be nonviolent, but when you see people who are naked, who are defecating in the streets, when you see some of the encampments that's obviously that is somebody that is mentally ill and we do absolutely nothing. That's why I said in the beginning that we might be in a tipping point in our country where things have gotten so bad that we are forced to do something about mental illness. I'm sure many of you remember when we used to have the big institutions like Camarillo and we thought it was horrible. And so we shut those institutions down, but we did nothing for the people. And it's a similar thing in terms of incarceration. We do know that some people should be released. Some sentences were extreme, but you don't just throw people who have been incarcerated for a long time back in the community and expect everything to be okay. So, so Congresswoman, you are a congressperson. Mm -hmm. It's so, I mean, you know, when I'm sitting there speaking with Bob Anderson or Richard Close, we said, we, we say, yes, yeah, something's gotta be done for the ment mentally 
for people with mental illness. We, 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 it's very easy to say, yes, things need to be done for these drug addicts. Right. So you're a congresswoman. What is being done? What is being talked about? What is the solution to dealing with the mental illness problem? This is not something, this is, you know, this is something that's been, you know, going on for years and years. You live in this city. You see the people going crazy. You go back to your office and, and, Los Angeles and you say, oh, something's got to be done. Well, what is being done? What's being talked about? What's the solution? So, so let me talk local and then I'll talk federal because uh, that's exactly why I was in the hospital last week. That's exactly why I'm trying to work with the governor's office right now so that we can open up 344 beds. You know, back in the 90s, we actually had an array of substance abuse programs throughout the county. Uh, I'm glad to say that in the Valley, Tarzana Treatment Center still exists and they actually have a lot of facilities around, but we used to have a lot of drug treatment programs and you could go and stay in those programs for a year. They were supported by Medicaid, but you know what happened? We changed, policies changed. We changed that system over to a managed care system so that now you get 30 days residential treatment. Now, what do you think somebody who's been on the street four and five years, strung out on drugs, who's decided they're ready to get sober, what are they gonna do with 30 days? So I've been working with county officials, actually county officials that I worked with back in the days of Community Coalition to see how we reform a substance abuse treatment network. Right now, there is nothing for folks. So those are two concrete things that I'm doing. Now, the bad news is when you ask me what's happening on a federal level, not yeah, much. Not, not mental, much. And, I, and I'm, I'm starting. Go ahead. Health. Nothing. So nothing's been done federal. Well, you know I me, mean, what I can tell you is being done is that there's tons of great legislation in our Southern California delegation, Grace Napolitano. He, she heads up that work. We support her. She has introduced numerous bills. We pass them out of the House and look what happens. Now you see President Biden trying to get legislation passed and having difficulty with the Senate. So I'm proud to say that we've been able to get things out of the House and then they stall in the Senate. Now, President Biden's not able to do it. Okay, all right. So let's go on to an easier subject, I guess then. Um, <laughs> well, that's, that's not the answer that I was hoping for. I'm um, sorry. That's okay. As maybe you will change it. That's, um, <laughs> Uh, Maria Calvin, you you shoot your mic should be open for the next question. It is. Hi, I, I call that one, huh? What? No, go ahead. Okay. Hi, Congresswoman Bass. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Uh, my question is that there's a growing concern nationally that large corporate investors are spending billions of dollars buying up single-family homes for yeah. rental purposes. Yeah. outbidding individuals for homes, causing prices to rise, making housing more unaffordable for individuals. We know the Biden administration is now looking at legislation that can curb the ability of these investors to buy large quantities of homes. It's a problem in LA as well. Yes. Do you, would, what would you do in the way of legislation that we could curb some of this uh, because that's what's causing a whole lot of problems here on affordable housing. You know, um, uh, and let's go back to SB9, for example, because you know that is one of the problems with SB9, right? I mean, there's no way to really say that it's not a, uh, a speculator. Um, and I think that there should be more guardrails. You know, the, the sad thing and, and going back to what Matt said, uh, the sad thing is, is that because of the roadblocks here, a lot of stuff does have to be dealt with uh, locally. I don't think anything would come out of the federal government, to be honest with you. I know you guys don't want to hear that, but I think you do want me to be honest with you. Uh, and I think that it is going to have to be dealt with uh, locally and statewide. And so I think putting more guardrails up, but at the end of the day, it is very, very difficult because, you know, I mean, it's where I live in L.A., I mean, I come home, people are trying to swindle me out of my home all the time. And I don't know if you have this problem in the Valley, but we definitely have this problem in parts of LA where you have speculators that prey specifically on elderly folks. 
they will go and try to get them to get their porch fixed or some type of uh, renovation or upkeep to the home. And the person doesn't realize that they've actually signed over their home. So some of it is just outright purchasing, but some of it is also swindling. And I think that needs to be stopped. Okay. Um, the next question is Marshall Longs and your, your um, mic should be unmuted as well now. Marshall? It is. Excellent. Go ahead and ask your question. Um, <clears throat> well, I had a couple. One, one question was, uh, did the fact that uh, um, the Democrats may uh, lose control of the House and possibly the Senate have anything to do with your seeking the mayor's position? No, it, I mean, you know what, it, it, this, is, this is a tough one for me, and it's kind of sad, but I do realize that people are so cynical about elected officials. I know that. And, and that, you know, when I say what is bringing me home is the crisis, it's sad that it's difficult to believe <laughs> that there's not some other motivation. But there really isn't. I mean, this was a really tough decision for me to make. And let me just give you a couple of examples. Foreign policy is one of my major loves. I'm the highest ranking woman on the Foreign Affairs Committee. I chair the subcommittee on Africa, which makes me responsible for all of the policy for the House of Representatives. If we go into the minority, I still work in those positions. I don't chair the committee, I become the ranking member. But the, ranking mem the, rank the current ranking member and I have worked together side by side for 11 years. So whether I'm chair or ranking member, I would still be doing the same work. I'm walking away from that work. When I uh, came here, I really wanted to work on child welfare, foster care. By the way, foster youth, are one of the reasons why children are homeless. There's 5,000 kids that are unhoused. Many of them are former foster youth. So I came here, I started a caucus on foster youth. I started a nonprofit on foster youth. I enjoy my work here. And one of the things that you know, don't know about Congress, this is a secret, we do actually do work across the, uh, across the line. So I work with Republicans all the time, even some of the most extreme ones that you see on TV, we actually do work together. It's just that the news never wants to talk about what we do together. And I'm fortunate that the policy areas I work on are very bipartisan. So no, that is not why I decided to leave. Okay. Well, there was a follow-up, Matt, if I, yeah. which was, uh, what, what do you think, uh, if you look in your crystal ball, um, the outcome of the, uh, the senatorial and, and well, and uh, congressional elections will be. I mean, it's not unusual to have, um, you know, the party out of power. Right. Well, history says we will lose the House. That's what history says. We thought that we weren't, weren't going to have a chance because of redistricting. But you've probably heard that redistricting didn't turn out the way we thought it would. The Republicans didn't take extreme measures around the country. And so we do have a shot at maintaining the House and we have a shot at maintaining the Senate. But you know, the way politics is, I mean, November is 10 years away. So anything could happen. And uh, Biden's in a little trouble now. So if you put it in this historical context, we shouldn't hold on. The other thing about me, again, I realize people view politicians so cynically. I'm done. I'm not running for anything else. I don't have aspirations beyond this. Uh, the, ne the, the next phase of my life will be called retirement. Uh, I've been involved in these issues since I was in middle school. And at some point in time, I think it's important to pass the baton. So I'm not doing this as a career move. Now, if I was thinking about it from a career perspective, I would stay in the house and run for leadership in the house. That's a career move. That's what I decided not to do. Well, you're too young to retire. No, I'm not. That's, I don't think that's gonna happen. Um, so so um, Richard is giving me the hook. So um, I'm gonna have to close out the questions. But a couple of people did um, give us questions online to, while you were speaking. They want to know um, who your point person is, who your campaign point person is, if they have follow-up questions for you. So do you have 
email for, or phone number for that, that point person? Joey Freeman, and he is Joey, J-O-E-Y, at KarenBass.com. Okay, great. Thank you. And Richard, and, did you want to do I'm sorry, go ahead, Karen. Or, you know, I, I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. I do hope the next time we're able to speak in person. And as a longtime neighborhood activist, uh, I love these kind of exchanges. So thank you for the opportunity. And thank you for being with us. And um, you'll be attending the debate, which is in our April meeting, the third Wednesday in April. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank you very much for taking the time to be with us and explaining your positions. And we look forward to seeing everyone in February, third Wednesday of the month. Thank you very much. And now I'm going to bed. Good night. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Love having you.